No, we have some visitors today, and I want to share with you a little bit about where we've been on Sunday mornings as a church this past year. I think one of the greatest tasks or responsibilities of a pastor, what's that? Oh, is to discern what God's word is for a congregation that he shepherds. And it's a heavy responsibility. Um, also living in the world that we live in, looking at what we're looking at, experiencing what we're experiencing, God profoundly, I believe, laid it upon my heart that we needed to focus this year on what it meant to live in community with one another and what it means to be in union with Christ. And I believe those go hand in hand. We can't be in community without first being in union with Christ. Amen? Because it's the power of God in our lives that enables us to love each other with the 1 Corinthians 13 kind of love. As a matter of fact, it's impossible for us to love each other with the 1 Corinthians 13 kind of love without Christ in us. We can't do it. And I think that's a little bit of what Jesus was meaning when he said in John 15, 5, that he was the vine and we are the branches. And if we remain in him and he in us, we will bear much fruit for apart from him, we can do nothing. I'm still one of those that believe the literal word of God. I mean, nothing means nothing. Amen. And so as we look at this passage of scripture and as we think about the description of love. Uh, there's a description here in, 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 in 1 Corinthians 13. There's also a description of the love of God in uh, 1 John chapter 4. But how are we, how are we to love each other? And if you don't mind, can we put the passage on the screen, 1 Corinthians 13? I would like for us to read it together. So if you'll read with me, you can look in your Bible. Of course, this is the English Standard Version, but you can read with us if it's hard for you to see this far, like me with the glasses. <laughs> but let's read this together. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains but have not love, I am nothing. If I give all, away all I have and if I deliver up my body to be burned but have not love, I gain nothing. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. We good? Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. As for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. When I was a child, I spoke like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child, but when I became a man, I gave up childish ways. 
For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. So now faith, hope, and love abide these three, but the greatest of these is love. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this description of love between members of the body of Christ. For the description of your love for us and our love for each other. God, as we do life together, as we are in union with you, God, help us to draw closer to you. And as we draw closer to you, we draw closer to each other in love. In Jesus' name, amen. As you remember, the Corinthian church was going through all kinds of problems. They were going with, through all kinds of issues of life. Their world was noisy just like our world is noisy. They were going through and dealing with some cultural influences that were in the church. Just as we sometimes, if we're not careful, can deal with cultural influences inside the church. And as Paul planted this church, he now writes a letter to this church as a spiritual father in their lives, as a shepherd to help them deal with some of the things that they were dealing with. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, he talks to them about the importance of the Lord's Supper and how to partake of the Lord's Supper. In chapter 12, he talks about spiritual gifts and how they are to be used and how they uh, are to be um, uh, practiced. And he talks about the body of Christ being one body but many members. And, and you guys need to know in Corinth... You, one of you can't say to another person, I don't need you. The hand cannot say to the foot, I don't need you. When we are living in such a way where we say we don't need each other, we're not being obedient to the Lord. We need each other because we're part of the body of Christ. And then he talks about at the end of chapter 12, he talks about but above all that, I'll, I'll show you a more excellent way. And then he deals with the subject of love, the way of love. And that's what we're focused on. We did a little introduction last week. But today we're going to talk about love's prominence. Now the word prominence means the state of being important or famous. The fact or condition of standing out from something. It's prominent. And what Paul is doing here is he's teaching the Corinthian believers about love. He is calling forth its prominence. And he does it using hyperbole. In verse 1, if you'll look at it, this is what he says. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clinging cymbal. He gives us three warnings in the first three verses of 1 Corinthians chapter 13. The first warning is, verse 1, don't trust in your eloquence, your ability to speak. He says, if I speak in the tongues of man and of angels, but I have not love, I'm a noisy gong or a clinging cymbal. What Paul is doing here is he's making comparisons. And again, he's using hyperbole to do so. He uses speaking in the tongues of men and of angels. What does that mean? What does that mean? Well, if you remember in Acts chapter 2 at the day of Pentecost, the gift of tongues fell on those and the people that were gathered from all of these different nations, they came to the Jerusalem, and, 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 and they, were, they heard people speaking in their native language. And there was given the gift of tongues. Listen to what it says in Acts chapter 2, verse 6. And at this sound, the multitude came together, and they were bewildered because each one was hearing them speak in his own language. And they were amazed and astonished. Are not all of these who are speaking Galileans? 
And how is it that we hear each of us in his own native language, Parthians and Medes and Elamites and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene and even visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabians. We hear them telling in our own tongues the mighty works of God. Paul is saying, if I speak that way, if I'm given revelation and gift to be able to speak in tongues, if I have this incredible gift bestowed upon me from God, but I don't have love, I'm just a noisy, clinging symbol. Again, the prominence of love. And, and here's the thing. We need to be careful that we don't come to the biblical text here with our sentimentalized view of love, our earthly view of love, uh, that it's a mere emotion or mere feeling. We're, we're talking about a particular kind of love. Did you know that God himself describes himself as love? God is love. So we want to look at this biblically. This Bible, the one that you hold in your hands, is all about telling the story of God's love to you. Amen? And then it also talks about your love back to God. And then it talks about our love between each other. So God's loved us, for God, Leon said, for God so loved the world that he gave. God's love to us. And then in passages of Scripture, our love back to God. First John, the way we show God we love him is by obeying his commands. Our love back to God. God makes obedience possible. Apart from Christ, the Bible says that we are slaves to sin. Now with Christ, we are slaves to righteousness. Our ability to be obedient doesn't come from ourselves. It comes from God. And us surrendering to him. What about the tongues of angels? Now, do y'all remember the story of Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 2 and 4? And he's talking about himself, but he doesn't use the first person. Listen to what he says in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 2 through 4. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven. Whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And I know that this man was caught up into paradise, whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know, God knows. And he heard things that cannot be told, which man may not utter. He heard the language of heaven. He heard the language of the angels. And he is saying with dramatic, hyperbolic Wording and thought. If I speak in the tongues of man, if I'm given this great gift and ability from the Lord to speak in somebody's language, if I'm able, if I hear the, the language of the angels, but I don't have love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. Again, what do we simple folks get out of this? You can have everything in the world, but if you don't have love, you have nothing. You can have everything in the world. You can have all the ability that the world admires you for. But if you don't have love, you have nothing. And I would submit to you because God is love. If you don't have love, you don't have God. Do not trust in eloquence, Paul says, when he's talking about the, the prominence of love. And remember last week we talked about love being the, the, the mortar of the church. Love is what holds the bricks together. We're all bricks. But what keeps us together? 
It's not feeling. It's not emotion per se. It's the love of God. Amen? It's the love of God. And because God loves us and we respond back to him in love, we love each other because he tells us to. Do not trust in eloquence. Secondly, verse 2, do not trust in certainty. So what do you mean by that? He says, and if I have prophetic powers, and if I understand all mysteries, and I understand all knowledge, and if I have all faith, so as to remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. Again, he's using hyperbole here. He is, he is stretching the imagination. He is saying, if I have all of this, if I have this ability, if I have this gift, but I don't have love, I'm nothing. Again, Prophetic powers, uh, people in the Bible were given the gift of prophecy. I believe people today are given the gift of prophecy. But folks, I'm here to tell you, a true prophet is tested this way. If their prophecy does not come true 100% of the time, they're not a true prophet. And if you remember, during the election, we had all kinds of people claiming to be Christians who, who, who prophesied all kinds of things, and they didn't come true. They're not a prophet. Period. And I believe there's a prophetic element to the pastoral preaching ministry. And again, earlier, talking about a word from God, the heaviness of that, the warning of it. Paul says, if I have prophetic powers, if God gives me prophetic powers, if, I, if I'm able to understand all mysteries... You remember Daniel interpreting dreams in the Old Testament. You remember Pharaoh's dreams. Joseph was given the ability to understand what Pharaoh's dream meant, and Joseph, God used that, gave Joseph that ability. It wasn't Joseph, God, it came from God, but God used that to make Joseph second in command in Egypt. His brothers put him in the in the, in the cistern, left him for dead, but God had other plans. Amen? And God used him and raised him up to save the very people that threw him in the cistern. If I have that ability to understand all mysteries, listen, folks, be careful. Don't go to all kinds of sources for information. Go to the Word of God. God has given us everything we need for life and godliness. Man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. And every word that comes from the mouth of God is right here. Do not trust in certainty. Again, we're not saying don't be certain about things. But listen, if you are so interested in being certain about something, but you don't have love in your certainty, in your ability, what does he say here again? And if I have prophetic powers, and if I understand all mysteries, and all knowledge, if I can explain everything that's going on about the pandemic, if I can have every single question answered about mask mandates, if I can understand all the science, but I have not love, I am nothing. And let me tell you guys, if we're not careful, we can get involved in this culture and we can become unloving people. And I think the world needs us to be loving. God called us to be loving. But hear me, it's a loving thing to tell the truth when we know it. Do not trust in certainty. Paul says, if I have all knowledge, and if I have all faith, so as to remove mountains, but I have not love, I am nothing. 
I'm nothing. Nothing is nothing. And you know what I'm thinking about right now, just this moment. I didn't think about this while I was preparing the message. It's almost the ploy of Satan in the Garden of Eden, isn't it? Did God really say? Did God really? God doesn't want you to do this. God doesn't want you to do that. He knows that you'll know the difference between good and evil. God, you, you understand what I'm saying? He, he, he is the epitome of antichrist. He is the epitome of anti-God. He spews his poison. He spews his deception. And he's still doing it today if we're not careful. And if we're not careful, we're prone to follow it and look at it and, and, and maybe even believe it. And by the way, he's not loving. He's the polar opposite of loving. He is hate. If I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to, so as to remove mountains, but I have not love, I am nothing. What Paul is saying, I am nothing. Apart from love, I am nothing. Apart from love, everything is nothing. And then lastly, do not trust in works. Verse 3, if I give away all that I have, and if I deliver up my body to be burned, and that could mean if I deliver up my body to death. Some uh, translations say, don't use the word burned, but give their body up to death. If, if I give away all that I have, and if I deliver up my body to be burned or to be given up to death, but I have not love, I gain nothing. Yes, the Bible does say in James 2.14 that faith without works is dead. I don't believe you can have faith and not have love. Amen? Because even the ability to have faith doesn't come from us. It's a gift from God. It is by grace that we've been saved through faith, and it's not of ourselves. It is a gift from God, not to, as a result of works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's workmanship. That word workmanship literally means masterpiece. For we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works. So when you think about these three warnings, when he talks about love and the promise of love, do not trust in eloquence. You can be a great preacher. You can be a great teacher. You can be a, a, a great human being in the world's eyes, and you can have the ability to be the, this professional speaker, or, or, or you have the ability uh, to, again, understand languages, and, and, and you have the ability to, to, uh, to, to speak in the tongues of, of angels. But if you don't have love, you're just a clinging symbol or a noisy gong. You can be a smart person. You can be intelligent. You can know a lot. You can know about, quote, unquote, the certainties of life. You can have prophetic powers. You can understand mysteries and knowledge. And you can have all kinds of, you can have all faith to remove mountains. But if you have not love, you are nothing. You can even give away all that you have. You can deliver up your body to be killed. But if you have not love, you gain nothing. And I don't believe it's too simple to say all we need is love. But you got to remember, let's define it. God is love. It's not the love we put on a piece of paper. It's not a heart. It's not a necklace. 
It's not a sentimentalized view of a worldly kind of love that is feelings-based that comes and goes. It's a person. It's the Godhead. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. So how do we love? Again, he gets into specifics in later verses, and we're going to talk about it. Love is patient. Love is kind. But I want to close with this thought in application to us today. The way to love others is first to repent. Turn from any sense of your own abilities, your own strengths, or your own works. Repent from, repent from that. Trying to do it without God. Thinking you can love without God. Repent from that and acknowledge to God that it's foolishness and it's weakness. And instead look to Jesus and ask for his forgiveness and his salvation through faith in Christ. Christ's salvation saves you. It forgives you of your sins. It transforms you, listen guys, from the inside out. Different than the world. The world looks outside in, if they even look in. Right, young lady that we were talking earlier today? Yeah. The world looks at people. Sometimes we look at each other from the outside in. And one of the conversations I was having with somebody up here earlier, God looks from the inside out. Man looks at the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. Christ's salvation saves you. It forgives you of your sins. It transforms you from the inside out. Love them from that inside out transformation. Folks, listen. Your pastor is being transformed from the inside out. Love me that way. But guess what, pastor? The people that you have the privilege of shepherding are being transformed from the inside out. Pastor, love them that way. Amen? Because if we love each other from the outside in, oh, guess what? Anybody live perfectly? Anybody, anybody walk perfectly with the Lord? And there's no one that walks perfectly with the Lord. You live and you hang around and you do life with people long enough eventually they might do something that you don't particularly care for. But if we love each other from the inside out with agape love, the love that holds us together, the love that binds the bricks together, that's love that glorifies God. That's the love that God calls for in the church. That's 1 Corinthians 13 kind of love. Folks, listen, love is the fruit of saving faith. Galatians 5, and 23, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. Love is the fruit of saving faith. We cannot produce it in our own strength. But it's the work of God bringing it into your life and out of your life. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for loving us. We thank you that you are patient with us. We thank you that you are merciful to us. God, we thank you that you are love. And I believe it's 1 John 4 that says, this is love, not that we loved God, but that he, that you loved us, and you sent your son to be the propitiation for our sins. God, thank you for love. And God, may this 1 Corinthians 13 love, this 1 John 4 love, this biblical love, continue to be manifested and transformational in all of our lives from the inside out. And as it is inside of us and as it comes out of us, 
your very presence, we are bonded together. We are one in the bond of love. Help us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.